uh, and I see more people joining and also uh, more people uh, turning on their cameras. So that's really wonderful to see many familiar faces uh, and also a number of new faces. So welcome everyone again. The next step uh, is for me to actually share with you a link to the mirror board, which is the uh, uh, interactive tool we will be using this afternoon. Uh, so you should all see that uh, in the uh, in the chat. So let's also take a couple of minutes for everyone to just navigate their way and open up the mirror board. And I will also uh, share my screen uh, to uh, help uh, give you an idea of what the uh, uh, the intention is for this afternoon. Uh, so I will just get uh, started very uh, slowly because, like I said, I noticed that there's still a few more people joining. Um, <clears throat> and uh, you should also all see my screen as well. Uh, and let me see. So I, I, I'm sure that many of you have already used Miro before, but for some of you, it's also maybe a little bit uh, new and intimidating. Uh, we will uh, try to make it as simple as possible. Uh, and you also have the default of always using uh, the chat at any point in time. If you feel like the mirror board is not working for you, uh, then please just share uh, any questions, comments in the chat. Feel free to also use uh, your digital hand. Uh, you can use your physical hand, but it's sometimes a little bit more difficult for me to see. Uh, but by all means, uh, the intention for this afternoon, as you already heard from Giovanna, is to bring you along this journey. Uh, and that uh, really also uh, implies that we would love to have your active participation. Um, so just to, to get us every to get us started and also to get you, let's say, comfortable with the tool that we will be using uh, this afternoon, um, <clears throat> we have a very quick uh, exercise uh, where we would like to invite you to just write down your name and your city um, and also indicate whether you're from a public authority, a company, a knowledge, knowledge institution, um, or, or other, so civil society, nonprofit organizations. So I would just write my name. Uh, Cornelia Dinka uh, from OASC. And uh, let's see, I already see uh, Alex, that's fantastic. And, uh, and Irene from Deloitte, uh, welcome. Let's see if we can get a few more stickies and that gives us a good indication that everyone is ready to, uh, uh, to actively participate. So Matteo, it's great. And uh, Michael from the team, that's fantastic. And Timo <clears throat> from Forium Helsinki, who we'll hear from uh, shortly as well. So um, that's fantastic. It takes a, uh, some seconds, but I, I see uh, Lars. Uh, so again, please uh, please feel free to, to add uh, to the uh, uh, sticky notes. And otherwise, like I said, the chat is also there for you if you'd like to introduce yourself in the chat, this is also um, more than welcome. So um, <clears throat> let's jump right into it. We're very strict on timing today and we have a lot that we would like to cover. So we'll, uh, uh, we'll get started. Uh, you already heard the brief introduction uh, to um, <clears throat> the first uh, part of the project where we uh, analyzed in quite some depth the data ecosystems of uh, six uh, cities and actually one metropole. Uh, and as you already heard, um, <clears throat> we're looking at data ecosystems from a very broad perspective. So including uh, people, organizations, technology, policies, and data, uh, and how all of these different dimensions interact to make use and reuse of data um, for a specific uh, purpose. In many cases, that's about uh, improving service provision is what we heard quite often. But what you see here is the, that the, the, the focus or the sectors were um, uh, in some cases similar, but also quite different in, in these cities. So with Barcelona, the focus has been on the uh, metropolitan housing ecosystem. Uh, with Helsinki, the focus has been on their uh, energy efficiency uh, in public buildings. Um, um, and then with some cities that has been more broad, broader, let's say on their uh, data platforms or uh, data ecosystem and data warehouse, as has been the case for Bordeaux Metropole and Rome, for example. So what we try to, uh, one, of, one of the key goals for this exercise has been to try and understand what are the key enablers and the key obstacles in building uh, these, these data ecosystems and being able to share, reuse, and uh, get value uh, uh, out of the data. 
Uh, and this is what we would like to, or this is the first exercise, let's say, that we would like to share uh, with you and also validate with you. Uh, and we have uh, these enablers and these obstacles categorized uh, according to uh, the commitments of the uh, Living in EU um, platform. And I will not go through all of them and I will not go um, in detail, but I will highlight some of them. And then really, this is an invitation for you to validate, to respond, are these uh, similar? To, do you recognize these challenges and these enablers? You can use the, uh, the, the green dots uh, if you recognize them. So you can just simply drag one of these dots uh, to, to one of the uh, enablers that you recognize. Uh, you can also drag a yellow dot if you think this is something that's quite interesting you'd like to know more about. So we can also have a bit of a discussion. And if it's something that you absolutely don't recognize, uh, then uh, you can also use a, a red dot to, to indicate that. So when we look at some of the uh, enablers, and it's really great to see that already uh, there are some dots moving, uh, <clears throat> we found uh, that one of the key um, enablers is when data sharing is mandated through contractual agreements. Um, <clears throat> So that's from a, from a legal side. And the, the flip side to that as a key obstacle, uh, we found that um, legacy contracts that don't specify data sharing requirements is one of the key barriers uh, to building these uh, data ecosystems. Uh, from a technical uh, perspective, we found that uh, many cities usually start with a single data repository when they are starting to innovate with data. Um, and we found that uh, this question of data quality assurance is, is really a, a very important uh, prerequisite. And very similarly, or, or let's say the, the, the flip side to that, uh, we found that uh, the vendor lock-in and potential and the fact that quite often there are different solutions used in different departments and different silos that are not very easily brought together is, is one of the main uh, obstacles. Uh, so this, let's say, fragmented data infrastructure uh, is, is one of the key obstacles that many of the cities uh, uh, pointed out in the analysis. Then if we look at uh, uh, financial dimensions, the um, business opportunities, uh, we, uh, we, we heard from some of the cities who, who shared with us that they really thought that uh, if businesses um, uh, could, could be motivated uh, to join the data ecosystem if there were let's say incentives, or if they could, if there was something in it for them. And very often finding these incentives is, is still uh, a challenge. Many cities are not at the point that they can actually, um, let's say, articulate these opportunities for the businesses. And uh, we also found that, um, I'm going to have to move some of the <laughs> sticky so I can actually see what I'm reading. Um, we also heard quite often that uh, data owners will share uh, data when they when they can see this this value in return, but again, this is not very uh, often uh, made explicit, or it's it's not something that cities are able to um, uh, operationalize very well. And uh, as a key obstacle, we also heard that the cost of infrastructure is quite often a barrier uh, to building the data ecosystems. Then, if we move uh, a little bit to the discussion of skills and knowledge. Uh, we heard from some cities uh, that uh, having in-house technical skills and expertise is a key enabler for, for building their data infrastructure and ecosystem. Uh, and again, the flip side, we heard from a number of cities that the, the lack of in-house ca uh, capacity and capabilities is a, is a key obstacle. And uh, something else we heard very often is, is, is uh, a link to this culture and ability of, of people to work across uh, departments, to work with each other. When, when, uh, when th that is the case, that is a key enabler. But very often uh, we heard that most cities are still at the point where uh, the internal coordination and the siloed working culture is a key barrier uh, to building the data ecosystems. Uh, and then in terms of something, um, uh, another key dimension that came up very often is, is political support. So we heard very often, uh, and actually I think in all cities, uh, that uh, uh, political support was, was really a, a very big enabler for the ecosystems and for innovating with data. Uh, and we also heard, again, the flip side that uh, the electoral cycles and political barriers can be, uh, can be a big challenge. 
Uh, and another very uh, important uh, obstacle that we heard about uh, quite often from the cities was that um, many uh, data owners are reluctant to join the data ecosystem. And very often that has to do with fears of losing ownership, uh, fears of giving up power. Uh, in some cases, it has to do uh, with uh, concerns over GDPR compliance. Uh, but, uh, uh, but this is a very, very big barrier as well. Uh, so I'm going to pause there for a second. I do see a lot of movement already, uh, especially for the enablers. Uh, but maybe we will also have some movement for the uh, obstacles, I can imagine. So again, this is an invitation to uh, just reflect uh, on what, what are the um, enablers and the obstacles that you recognize yourself. And if you think of a key enabler or an obstacle from your experience that is not captured at the moment, you can also add that to the board. Uh, and you can do that by simply uh, typing it uh, on one of the stickies and dragging it on if you'd like to do so. Uh, I'm also looking at the chat. Let's see. Uh, uh, Cornelia, just one thing. We're out of green stickies. We're out of green stickies. Okay. Green dots, we don't have any more. So there's a lot of agreement, it, it seems, in, in our group. Okay, so I'm also just, um, let me see here. Uh, well, if we have a lot of, uh, uh, well, maybe we can actually just have a bit of a, of a discussion about, uh, about all the dimensions where we have agreement. Um, and and maybe there's Cornelia, a yes. sorry to jump in, but uh, it's always possible to uh, copy paste the, the dots uh, and the stickers. So Alex, in case you've run out of, and you'd like some more, just control C, control V will do, will do the trick. So I see that we're getting some more green stickies. Uh, so thanks for that real time uh, innovation here. Um, <clears throat> I'm just going to pause for a second and see uh, if there's anyone uh, who would like to just reflect or react to uh, these key enablers or obstacles that uh, I just discussed. Or if you'd like to comment on on uh, where you added the stickies for what reason. So just an open invitation. Anyone? I'm just checking to see if I see any hands. I don't think that's the case. And I also don't see any virtual hands. So certainly the data sharing mandated through contractual agreements, uh, it seems like that's one that uh, there's a lot of uh, uh, recognition, but also data quality assurance. Um, also the political support, I see a lot of uh, people recognize all of these enablers. And one that uh, I see in terms of the obstacles so fragmented data infrastructure there is some recognition, but also somebody saying this is not a challenge in their city. So if anyone uh, who added that red sticky would like to comment, um, then again, this is just an open invitation to just jump in and, and reflect if you'd like to do so. I, I think I see Lars speaking, but I don't think it's, I think uh, you're muted and I don't think it's your intention to jump in or was it Lars? Lars, I don't think we can hear you. I wonder if it's because I think you might not be connected to audio. It seems to me that um, uh, you do not have a connection to audio, unfortunately. Uh, because for everyone else, I see a, a muted microphone, but with you, I don't see the muted microphone. Oh, try it now. Unfortunately, we do, still don't hear you. So my only suggestion in this case uh, would actually be um, um, to, to maybe log out of the meeting and join again. I wonder if that will fix it. I don't think I have any other suggestion at the moment. So that's quite unfortunate. We had somebody enthusiastic to share, but now uh, <laughs> we can't hear him. So if there is anyone else that would like to uh, respond, then, uh, then, then please do so. And otherwise we will move also to the next, uh, next step of the, um, uh, of the board. Diego, I see you turned your camera on. Is that because you wanted to comment? 
my my comment was was more on the process. So um, for for me, it's the first time that I'm seeing um, this on a digital medium. So I'm I'm aware of this in a physical process, and um, and yeah, and how um, how the, the, the being it digital it also influences a bit uh, the choices that people are making instead of um, having paper. Um, post it um, on a, on a physical board. So it was more a comment on the process than on the um, on the choices that people are making and that I'm also making. Okay. And are you are you suggesting that potentially as soon as people see green stickies added to a certain green dots added to a certain sticky and therefore they have the inclination to do the same? Is that what you're referring to, or not necessarily? Just saying that uh, that uh, this this the digital process would um because we there are also people in different locations, <clears throat> so when there is a physical space, um when when several persons are are putting the um, stickers in the in the same place, there is a group of people. Also, sometimes it's difficult even to go there, and in here this is allows uh, different levels of freedom, um, and um. And this, this that you, you were saying with the, with the green stickers happens also with people. Where there are more persons in a certain place, there, there will be more people there too. Um, okay, thank you for uh, thank you for this comment. Yeah, I think we're all learning on how to facilitate yes. these uh, kinds of interactions in an agile way, but also in a digital yes. setting. Yes. Uh, I think Jenny, I see your hand, please. No, I just wanted to point out that people are of course free to add the sticky notes. I think you have provided provided on the side of the board so that people can add their own input if that answers Diego's concern. So Diego, I'm not sure if that answers your question, but indeed uh, everyone is invited if there are uh, enablers or obstacles that you'd like to, to add. Uh, so besides actually just voting uh, or indicating which ones you recognize or don't recognize, you can add other ones on the sticky notes uh, you see uh, on the right hand side and those can be moved also to the board. Yes. Lars, I see you're back. So hopefully your microphone works this time if you'd like to give it a try. I'm afraid we still don't hear you. It has, to, I'm, I think it has something to do with your uh, microphone uh, connection. Maybe if you'd like to comment in the chat, uh, I would suggest you, you can share a comment in the chat. And in the meanwhile, if there's no one else who would like to comment on the key enablers and obstacles, then I will suggest, uh, and, but feel free to, to if, if there are other thoughts that come to mind, uh, then feel free to come back to this portion of the board and add, uh, add some, um, yeah, add, add your thoughts or add your suggestions uh, later on as well. But in the meanwhile, we, uh, we should move on, I think, to the next uh, portion, because that's really also the focus for this session, um, is the sandboxing uh, approach. Um, and so as it was already um, uh, introduced, we're looking also the sandboxing approach from a very broad perspective. So uh, not just from a technological perspective, but also from the organizational processes and the data governance approaches, um, which can help these cities um, make better use and reuse uh, of, of data. Uh, so this is, this is uh, um, typically a, the sandboxing discussion would focus very much on technical environments uh, and we'll probably touch on that uh, some more as well, but it's not purely technical. So to, to try and um, specify it a little bit further. So what are these key elements that we're looking at? Uh, so we're, we're focusing or we're starting with the key challenges or pain points of the cities. And this has also been, let's say, the focus in what we call these uh, sandbox clinics uh, over the last uh, uh, couple of uh, months, together with uh, the four cities that we're, we're uh, working with. Uh, it has been a series of discussions to better understand their, uh, uh, their key challenges or a key pain point that they would like to focus on. So what we're building towards is this systematic experimentation approach uh, where they can safely uh, test in a technical environment. So before they move to production, uh, but having said that it is not just technical, but it's very much about bringing people around the table to test these uh, operational uh, and legal issues as well. So in that sense, sandboxing is also about supporting a multi-stakeholder co-creation process and dialogue. 
And what we found from these sandbox uh, clinics uh, is that there are some, uh, some key challenges uh, that the cities uh, are, are struggling with. So for example, uh, how to actually define these rules of the game to bring new parties into the ecosystem uh, and how to get companies to provide access to data. Um, or, or once the companies are actually providing access to data, how to get them to provide access to the right, to the right data and the, uh, the granularity and format. Um, <clears throat> And in some cases, it's much more focused on uh, automating uh, labor intensive uh, processes uh, or speeding up data integration. Uh, and in some cases, cities are actually just looking for how uh, for, for use cases that uh, they can make uh, use of in order to innovate with uh, historical data that they might already have available. Uh, and how to transition from uh, up uh, innovation sandboxes to operations is also something that we heard uh, from some of the cities. Uh, so this is an introduction to some of these challenges that we heard about, but the idea uh, for the next little while is actually to give uh, two of the cities uh, an opportunity to, to share their own experiences and to, to uh, share their challenges directly with you. Um, and, uh, and actually, if we can first go, uh, Timo, uh, uh, Timo Ruhamaki from Forum Virum Helsinki, I think you uh, were actually also hoping to share some slides, so I hope that's possible for you to do if you tr try, let me just stop sharing my screen for now. Uh, if you can try to share your screen, I hope that's uh, not a problem, you should have been made co-host. There we go. So Timo, you have about 10 minutes uh, for your presentation. The floor is yours. Okay, thank you. Yeah, greetings from Helsinki. Uh, so I'm from Forum Medium Helsinki, which is the innovation unit fully owned by the city of Helsinki. And our, our role typically is, is to look at the innovation projects and especially, especially look for, for the uh, EU funding instruments in a way uh, to boost the innovation inside the city. So, so we are dealing with uh, with a real life real life uh, issues and uh, problems and limitations on the city side, but trying to bring them in the in the uh, innovation projects as pilots. So, uh, starting with uh, Helsinki Data Strategy that came out a couple of years ago, uh, it laid out sort of an architectural vision, or at least at least the key key components that that were, were seen. The actual diagram is in Finnish. I, I still haven't had a time to translate it, but I, I created the translation to the left side. What are the key areas? And and one of the key areas that that we most mostly this is about on, on the left side. We have the internal departments and and their own data repositories and external data repositories like government sources and so on. Uh, on the bottom corner, the number nine is about governance in general, data catalogs, uh, rules, uh, policies, uh, and, and uh, authentication and, 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 and that sort of stuff. Uh, in the middle, uh, the data platform uh, that, is, that is containing the boxes, uh, three, four, five, six, uh, one area is is especially important for us from the innovation project point of view because uh, it's it's about real time data processing, real time situational awareness, and uh, partially also transactional transactional data, and uh, and and from our point of view, this is a nice continuation to the to the IoT, which is starting to be a bit of history already uh, but but the what we learned from from being able to handle handle the sensor data and and, and dealing with uh, real-time processing of sensor data it, it is something that that we can bring in to the to the this kind of uh, uh, this kind of scenario as well that how do we create the situational awareness out of that uh, the key capabilities have been laid out as, as a data pipelines or, or types of data pipelines and and this picture is, is trying to illustrate basically the different components that are involved in different types of different scenarios of data pipes. So, so as an example, if we start from the right side, uh, we have the uh, most traditional way to exchange data between systems, which is a file. So, so we would have a file share that would be FTP, it could be WebDAV, or it could be like a network drive. And, and then one system is sending it and the second system is receiving it. And of course, this is not, not the desired way, especially in the future. So, so we are trying to, as, as a governance, uh, we try to push uh, the development from the right to left from, from these kind of legacy, legacy approaches to, towards uh, modern API, harmonized data models, common data do domains, controlled vocabularies, and so on. 
And, and what is also important to keep in mind that when we are talking about data platform, of course, of course cities are quite complex entities, and, and um, especially in this, uh, this discussion, even though we are in, in a different group now uh, with the digital twin part or, or the uh, spatial part, uh, the uh, spatial data infrastructure, SDIs, are also part of the data platform, because that is one of the key operations of the cities. How do we create cartography? How do we maintain cadastre? How do we, how do, we do all that stuff? And also, it is one of the key characteristics of public sector in, in general that pretty much all of the data that the cities are producing are spatial, geospatial in, in some way. So the context is geospatial, um, and, and that is what differentiates also smart cities from industry platforms. And, and when, when we try to go to the, to the left side, also there is a room for innovation projects because there might be uh, work needed in, in the uh, governance, in the controlled vocabularies, taxonomies, ontologies, as an example, in linked data case, there might be need for data virtualization uh, in, in order to make that, that all happening. And of course, also the IoT data lake uh, for transactional data is, is also there. That, that how, what, what do we need as a capability in order to do process uh, data streams on live uh, instead of just getting everything in the data lake and the processing it after that. And, and the governance, this kind of governance action is also something that is uh, probably starting to replace the traditional role of enterprise architectures. Because the bigger the enterprise is, and especially in the cities, the role of enterprise architect has always been problematic because you cannot simply describe everything. And, and the architects are, are then focusing on, on things that are difficult to change. But even that is, that is um, next to impossible as a mission. And, uh, and, and there is an interesting, interesting paradigm, uh, uh, interesting uh, thinking called evolutionary architecture, which means that, that you are not even expecting that you could have a waterfall enterprise architecture. Instead of that, everything is moving, everything is growing, but you have fitness functions that will then take care of, of the chains and, and make sure that, the, that, as an example, service levels are maintained, even if the architecture is changing. But it is an interesting one to, to look at as well. So the data planes in theory are quite simple operational data plane running the business. Then we have ETLs and, and then we have analytical data planes that where all the, all the magic is happening. By the way, I'm, I'm stealing these pictures from Chamak Dignani, who is currently working on, on, on a new book. Uh, data mess, I think, is the name. We'll see. It's, it's out in, in January. But uh, we'll see. So, so in theory, everything is, is easy. But when we go to the practical level, of course, it's much more complicated. On the left side, operational data plane in the city of Helsinki, we have over 950 ICT systems. And this doesn't include all the registries. And of course, it doesn't include all the Excel files and, and data stores and everything. So when we start to create data pipelines, we have tens of thousands of data pipelines. And it's, it's a very different ball game than uh, when in the pilot or innovation project, you create a nice graphical workflow where you define a sensor and then you define the workflow after that. You can do it once, but you cannot do it 10,000 times in the same screen. And, and this is a big problem in, in the project. They, they, don't, they are not looking at the scales and replication that the cities really have. <clears throat> Some megatrends on, on the data platform, still stealing from Tamak on, on these ones, because these fit so well. Organization, organizationally, moving from centralized ownership to decentralized ownership. I think in the ICT world, this is something that is confusing all the account managers and salespeople in, in the ICT companies when they are selling to other enterprises, that actually the ICT department is not the one where you do the selling. If you are selling a CRM system, you are not selling it to ICT department, you are selling it to the sales, sales department. And it is the same in the cities. The IC, role of ICT is not the one to create a central system for everything. You, you need to start from the departments and, and the organizational units. In architecturally, uh, starting the systems that are currently monolithic, of course, we are, we are moving to distributed. And this also fits to the, to the organizational structures, because typically also architectures are following organizational structures. If you have 10 departments, then we have 10 something in the architecture as well. And the word evolving is important here. Technically, uh, we are seeing that data as a byproduct of code, data as an output coming out of the system is, is moving so that we are seeing data and code as one unit. If we have a new indicator that we need to prepare, that might be one box that is doing both data and code. 
in the same box, but it, it's not a common server or common registry or anything like that. Uh, it is uh, like uh, creating a data as a product. Operationally, moving from top-down governance move towards federated computational governance uh, from top-down to, to a federated model, and especially important in the cities that have the organizational structure like it is. And principally, not seeing data as an asset to collect anymore, but more, more like data as a product that is where the value is coming from the sharing and not from the collection of the data. <clears throat> and finally, in 2020, 21% uh, of the public sector ICT projects in Finland were implemented as Microsoft services. This means over 60 kilo, kilo euro projects, and, and uh, this was over, over 450 projects altogether. And in, in this, uh, Microsoft means a, a cloud service that is uh, for a specific purpose. So it could be like ERP system or whatever. This doesn't include all the custom work that has been created on top of Amazon Web Service or Azure or, or OpenShift or anything like that, that is on top of this. So, so the, the, this number is growing very fast. And it is partially because the cities are now, now ready with the cloud policies. So the cloud is not anymore something that needs to be avoided, but it can be a fundamental part of the platforms as well. So the, the vision is, is the urban data space. Um, we have been working on the urban platform, especially as part of the Venus Finch project together with the city of Tallinn to create a cross-border cross uh, data platform. But uh, the urban data space probably is fitting better with, uh, with the current uh, wording and current thinking. So, so pretty much everything in our side is, is based on Kafka. So everything goes through that and, and that is doing the live uh, processing and, and, and live context enhancement and uh, encryption if needed and so on. And, and the second thing that is coming from Chamak's uh, data mesh thinking is the role of the data owner as, as a manager. So you don't see data engineers here anymore. So the technical skills that are needed in here are, are to create the platform and, and to administer it, but they, they are not related to data anymore. And, and the, the reason for that is that it is much easier for the cities to think about the data owner as a domain specialist. So if we have an environmental planner, he knows much better what is wrong in the data when he sees that than any data scientist or, or data engineers or anything like that. And it will make it a lot easier also to build these kind of structures because again, we cannot, if you have 10,000 data pipelines, we cannot have domain owners or business owners for 10,000 data pipelines, but we already have the analysts and specialists who are dealing with the space. And in order to do that, of course, pretty much everything is in cloud already. So we are using Snowflake, we are using Kafka, they are both SaaS services, lots of applications are SaaS services and so on. And how, how this is handled is that, that uh, as part of the SaaS services, we are expecting that they come up with the ecosystem for connectors. So as part of the SaaS service, you also get the connector. And, and this makes it, uh, this is breaking the vendor locks. Because what this means is, in practice is that this is a screenshot of our Kafka installation. So currently we are connecting it to the Snowflake. If we want to change that from Snowflake to Azure or, or Postgre or whatever, we change the connector. It's a five minute job. You, do, you are not anymore creating code, whether that is open source or, or proprietary. You, you just pick up the connectors and you pick up the services so that they are easy to use and easy to change. And finally, <clears throat> where that does the sandbox fit? fit? Uh, I think for me personally, the, the term sandbox has been problematic because uh, in, in the ICT, uh, sandbox has a specific meaning. And it, it, one, one of the characteristics of sandboxing is, is that it is isolated. But when we are thinking about, as an example, DevOps processes, uh, it is a problem if that is an isolated system, because the whole idea is that the staging, staging system and production system are about the same deployment of, of the same service in order to avoid problems where you have different configurations in two different parts. So you need to be able to test it exactly in the same setup what, where, where it is. And, and we don't need to have a separate instance of Kafka or, or Snowflake. We just have a separate da databases or even just separate tables for that. And of course, the be best case is that, that uh, that, that the first pilots are like MVPs of, of the future system. So they are real data and are real services. They are just limited 
in time. So, so we don't need to have isolation because of that. There is no danger in that, that trial. Uh, it is just limited and it is not useful, but, uh, but it still is something that, that can be done. So that's it from my side. Hopefully this gave you some thoughts and uh, uh, what's next? Yeah, moving on, thank you. Thanks, uh, thank you, uh, Timo. So that was a, a lot. Uh, I see also some uh, uh, some applause. Are there any questions or comments immediately? No questions or comments. Everything was clear. Okay. Um, maybe um, I'll just share my screen again. We can just briefly go to the to the mural uh, board. And uh, without really going in detail, uh, Timo, maybe if you were going to just articulate, let's say the, the, main, the main challenges, and again, you don't have to, this, this is something that we prepared in advance and you don't have to necessarily touch on them specifically. Uh, but if, you, if you're going to, from the Helsinki perspective, uh, and foreign viewer perspective, the main challenges and let's say the key goals that you, you think uh, uh, sh we should focus on for the upcoming period, uh, for the upcoming exercise. Is there something you that, that, that you wanted to highlight from, from what we had previously kind of prepared? Okay, maybe I will just put, put a sticker on, on the mirror or something. Yes. So I have to think about it a little bit. Fantastic. And actually that's an invitation also for, for everyone else. So again, you can use the, um, uh, the stickies, uh, the, the dots, uh, if there are some challenges that you hear that you recognize. Um, and you can also, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll come back to, to a bit more, uh, you know, share your input in a second. But first, uh, we'll go to the next uh, case study from, uh, from Milan. Uh, and for uh, this, I would like to give uh, Marco Lombardo the floor uh, for, uh, for your experience. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you, Cornelia. I wonder if you can share the screen on the Milan postcard on the mirror board. Thank you. So my name is Marco Lombardo. I work at the municipality of Milan and our office is the Smart City office, which in Italian is named Ecosystema Digital Urbano and it's an office inside the IT department of the municipality of Milan. Our journey to the, towards a digital ecosystem started in 2014, uh, when we had more than 200 uh, different applications. Each application had uh, its own database, and there was no data interoperability because uh, uh, the, the application did not talk to uh, each other. Uh, more than 75% of data exchange was made manually. So we started uh, in 2014 uh, in building uh, uh, an API on top of uh, every each uh, of the 200 application. And then we uh, put the, all the API together in an API catalog. And the API catalog is managed uh, via an API orchestrator, orchestrator. And the API orchestrator is the WSO2 uh, technology platform. So nowadays uh, we can, uh, we have a, we have an API catalog and the uh, API are consumed inside the uh, municipality of Milan. And uh, each department of the municipality of Milan can uh, request access to the API of the, all those uh, applications we have put to, together. Uh, the next step for us is to open this catalog, not just uh, inside our municipality, but also to third party private uh, pro private companies, uh, both in the sense uh, that private companies in the future may uh, ask us to, to uh, consume our, our API, or uh, either uh, that the, the private sector could uh, add their APIs to, to, to our catalog. So we would like to expand our, uh, our catalog and open it to the private sector. As you can see on the postcard on the mirror board, we have uh, some challenges. Uh, the first one is the uh, lack of awareness among private companies or regards what they can gain from the ecosystem. So we need to explain to private companies what the advantage for them of to consume our APIs and uh, also if they want to, uh, 
uh, if they want to, they can add their API to our catalog. Uh, one more challenge is the resistance from private companies to share their data because private companies uh, fear to lose the ownership on their data. Most of the time, those data are business uh, uh, sensitive. And uh, so uh, those companies care, care uh, a lot about uh, uh, the ownership of their data. One more concern about uh, for, uh, the stems from private companies is uh, violating the GDPR. Another challenge is the uh, lack of consideration for interoperability. Uh, and this is a challenge we, we face both inside our uh, municipality or uh, you know, in the state company. And also uh, in private companies, there is not yet the culture of the API interoperability. So what do we aim? We, our key goal uh, with the state company, uh, with the sandboxing is going beyond open data. Uh, we like open data, we are fond of open data, but open data uh, was not meant to uh, share real-time data about the city. Uh, for example, uh, data about uh, the public transport, they are uh, real-time data. And uh, often the uh, platform that share uh, open data, they are not, uh, uh, they are not sized to, to uh, share uh, uh, real-time data. Uh, going beyond open data does not mean we don't like the philosophy of open data, but just uh, uh, the open data infrastructure often is not uh, uh, is not good for uh, real time data. Then our goal is also to test the in, in, uh, incentives to enable access of private actors. So uh, we need to think about what we can offer to private companies to. Uh, uh, in order to make them uh, add their APIs to our catalog. And then we need to protect the information shared by third party providers uh, from uh, illegal uh, uh, use, uh, because uh, maybe uh, third party providers want to share the real time information, but uh, they don't want uh, uh, the, the user of the API to save the data and to analyze the data, but maybe they want to share just the real-time information without giving the user the possibility to, uh, to store the data. And uh, we, we need to be very careful about protecting the business sensitive information of uh, private company. And uh, we need to guarantee uh, the data protection for citizen so that uh, uh, sensitive information of citizens is not uh, are not shared. So often we aim um, to share uh, aggregated data uh, or uh, an anonymous data about uh, the, the the service that are that are replaced in our city. So that's an overview from me. And feel free to ask me any question about our uh, projects if you if you wish to. Thank you. Thank you, Marco. So again, I will pause in case there are some questions or comments for Marco. And again, an invitation if you'd like to indicate uh, using the dots, what are the things you recognize um, or you'd like to know more about. Can I make a question? Yes, please. Um, Marco, you, you were mentioning this um, this aspect of um, open data and real time. Um, do you want to, to speak a little bit more about this challenge? Do um, you think it's a technical challenge that can be overcome with time, or this is something that should always be different to open data and uh, real time data? OK. Think Mark. Right. Uh, it's a technical issue uh, because uh, when you API calls, for example, if you share data about uh, the parking, uh, there is a user that uh, may want to, to call the APIs every 30 seconds. Uh, and so there, ne there needs to be an infrastructure that can answer all those calls. So uh, our digital ecosystem may need, to, for example, to think about a way to uh, the way to uh, address the, the cost of the infrastructure. And maybe one of the things is to make uh, users paying for the infrastructure they use 
but not for the value of the data itself. So uh, what is different from open data is that uh, in the open data paradigm, the data are, are static. Like for example, you have data about uh, how many uh, hotels there are in our city or uh, how many buses there are in our, in our city, but uh, you, can, uh, you can find this information and you, can, you need to access them uh, maybe every day. So you make one, one API call every day. But when you uh, think about uh, new services and uh, smart cities, uh, there may be uh, data that need to be pro provided every 30 seconds. So the issue here is with the infrastructure that can answer all those calls uh, that coming from the users. So even if you don't make users paying for the value of the data itself, maybe the user needs to pay for the infrastructure that uh, needs to be consumed to uh, have an API call every 30 seconds or so. Does this answer your question? Yes, okay. grazie. Uh, you're welcome. Okay, are there any other questions or comments for either the Milan or the Helsinki cases? Otherwise, um, because we only have uh, 12 minutes left, so it's time goes by very fast. Uh, and for the last uh, uh, few minutes, then I would like to hand it over to my colleague, uh, Michael Mulkuin, who will take us through the last little exercise to get your input on the sandboxing. So Michael, uh, would you like to share your screen or would you like to just uh, uh, leave the screen the way it is and, and take us along? Why, why don't you why don't you manage the screen, Cornelia? That'd be easier. So so thank you very much indeed. Um, I'm your tour guide for the last few minutes of this journey, and and I think we've been on a great journey. We've been thinking about the uh, challenge and the opportunities of uh, putting in place a local data ecosystem, the enablers, the barriers, and we thought a bit about sandboxing as a way to help with that. What we want in the last few minutes of this session is for you to start to think a bit more. We, you've already started to think in terms of putting stickies in place, but to think a little bit more specifically about the things you've heard, particularly from Milan and from Helsinki, that you think are relevant to the challenges your city is facing and to the, um, the, the kind of questions that you're trying to grapple with. So you've got, as you can see um, there, you've got the two Post postcard things which remind us of the key issues that we've been hearing about. And underneath that is um, a two sandboxes, uh, if you like, one for Milan and one for, Hel for Helsinki. And what we'd like is you to be thinking and adding uh, your comments on the post-it notes for each box. So thinking about, for instance, the Helsinki story, which uh, was a, a complex, um, uh, picture of the challenges that you've got to make when you're trying to make your data ecosystem much more um, effective, uh, much more sophisticated, bring together data from many different sources, handle it in a much simpler way, uh, which means all sorts of changes that have to happen in the way you handle things. Um, uh, many, many challenges were mentioned there, which were very much to do with technical, but obviously had a lot of um, institutional issues as well about the way you looked at your organization. So start to think about Helsinki, for instance, uh, and the interesting idea that, um, that we can't just think of a sandbox in the traditional sense where it's very limited. You've got a, um, an isolated, uh, simple environment where you can test new applications, but actually you need to, we still need to be able to experiment, but we need to be much more flexible in how we do it. So if you could start to think about uh, Helsinki, and about your city and about any issues that are important to you and click on one of those um, post-it notes and start to enter any information about that, that that you think is valuable. We need to know how relevant uh, these uh, case studies that we're sharing with you are to the cities that, that you all represent. So if you can, and if, if you find that a challenge, please put stuff in the chat. The chat's really easy. So if you've got any ideas, any reactions or thoughts to the things that Timo was sharing from Helsinki? And then um, Milan was talking in a, in, a, in a much more practical way, if you like, about the challenge of here's Milan that's done a great deal of work in pulling together all of the many different systems it had in place 
and making things work much more uh, much more effectively together within the city council and providing um, API ways of, of, of sharing and, and working together. And, and now that challenge, how can they bring the private sector, municipally owned companies, but much wider, how can they start to come into this um, ecosystem? How can they, um, they be incentivized to see the value to them of the data that the city owns, but also the, the value of being able to share their data with the city and, 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 and to be able to be convinced that the city has the competence and the ability to make sure that when they share their data, um, it will be handled properly, privacy will be um, uh, uh, dealt with all the issues there, security and all of those things, and that it will provide added value to them. So can we just spend a few moments, um, if you've got whatever thoughts you have about um, the issues that Milan or Helsinki are facing, questions you have, whether there are some of these similar things, and, and whether you think there's any lessons that you can learn from them. Can we see a few people being brave enough to start to share and, and, and give, us a, <laughs> give us a start on this? Who's gonna be the first? Well, I can start, Michael, just to break the ice. Thank you, Carlo. Uh, Thank you, yes. No, as uh, we heard uh, about the experience from Milan, but uh, uh, also Rome was one of the cities uh, that uh, was involved in, in our project. And uh, as, uh, as I am now based in Rome, you know, I'm just uh, sharing <laughs> that, um, yeah, they're, they have a, they're facing a similar uh, situation in which they have to uh, show com private companies and also municipal mm -hmm. companies that uh, they both have an interest in, uh, in sharing data. And so what they are trying to do, and now I'll also complete a post-it so that you should, you should be able to see it here, let's see. Uh, what they're trying to do is to have small case studies, like in the mobility sector. Mm -hmm. And the case studies are meant just uh, to, to show, you know, in a very safe uh, um, and limited environment that by sharing data, win-win situations can be generated. Like, let me give you an example. If um, uh, an e-scooter, an e-scooter company shares uh, data about the location of their scooters, uh, the, the municipality uh, is uh, happy about that because it has data that can feed into the ecosystem. But at the same time, the company is happy about it because, uh, mm, I don't know, apps uh, or even the municipality platform can show where these scooters are. So th this also generates, uh, uh, let's say, useful, um, um, yeah, a, a useful dissemination, a useful advertisement for the, comp for the e scooter company itself. So I I'm writing it now. Let me know if you can see it. Mobility sector yep. case studies to showcase and, win, and, win. and while and while sorry and while Carl is doing it we also anybody else please feel free to add your own notes so thanks thanks continue sorry Carla yeah you know this this is it uh, from Rome uh, where the city is uh, as I said trying to reach out to to companies and uh, show how you know data sharing can generate benefits for the city yes but also for the companies themselves. So that after, you know, uh, letting them understand what's in it for them, then it's much easier to have them share their data rather than just, you know, knocking at their door and asking for their data, which is usually, uh, you know, very, um, very sensitive from a business perspective. Thank you very much, Carla. Great. Anybody else? Who else would like to share? I think the... For me, the interesting part of that is uh, what we're not talking about as a sandbox. We're talking about sandboxing as a kind of, it's a state of mind, it's an approach to things. And I think what we're talking about here is very often when you have a big challenge that you want to achieve, like how can we get private sector companies to join into our, um, uh, our data ecosystem? You know, that's a big complicated challenge. It's about how can we break that down into small chunks 
and experiment in a in a kind of more playful and a collaborative way in a way that's not so big and serious but where we can try things out with our partners and so on and we can we can start to learn together and build relationships and get build the foundation to solve the bigger things good well we've only got a few more minutes left um the last thing uh, that we'd really like to ask you to do on the um, blue uh, post-it notes is um, we've been thinking about a range of different things. So just think now back over this last nearly an hour now, as we've been looking at building a data ecosystem and how sandboxing can help and some of the challenges that need to be dealt with and how they can be solved. So if, if take one of those post-it notes and start Start right very simply. Any question, any recommendation that you may have, any thought, any recommendation for us as we try and uh, build some le good lessons that can be shared more widely about um, how we can use sandboxing to help. So again, be bold. Um, th this is where we can learn from you and, and we need to learn from you, your ideas and your thoughts. So let's have some people starting to write down questions, uh, suggestions, um, thoughts, reactions, lessons that you've learned from listening to uh, Cornelia, uh, to, to, to looking at the results of the work so far, and listening to Tim and, and Marco about the, the work that's, uh, the, the, their perspectives in Milan and, and in Helsinki. Uh, let's see, come on, let's see some bold people put some things down. We've only got about a minute left. Um, and if you can't have time, Pop it in the chat because we're going to capture everything we can uh, and learn from you. Well, Michael, I can also break the ice yeah. here, but uh, if, <laughs> <Thank anyone you. laughs> raises, if anyone raises his hand, I'll, I'll gladly leave the floor. Uh, good, good. I mean, one important lesson learned that that uh, has emerged is that uh, um, sandboxing as a methodology is useful not only to test new technical solutions a new technology mm. or a new software or a new tool but also and perhaps even more importantly to test a new governance approach for instance because let me give you an example again if you're trying to bring companies within the ecosystem it's usually not merely a matter of a technological matter, but sometimes it's more thing about the governance. It's more, as I said, about convincing them that it is a win-win situation, that they can really get something out of it. So uh, again, the idea is that sandboxing can be a tool, is a tool for testing solutions, not just technical ones, but also more, let's say, governance ones. Indeed. Um, I mean, that, that, that's the, the, the fun thing that we're learning. We've just got less than half a minute left so please, this is your last chance to get something down. But, but this is very much about um, looking to see how these, um, these opportunities for light, um, but really important um, experimentations can help you explore all of the issues, not just technical, but institution as well, governance, contractual, operational, all uh, worries about, uh, about uh, uh, other things like that. So whatever it is, lots of valuable lessons for us. And now I think it's time for us to go back into the plenary. Thank you very much indeed. Let's, let's go, everybody. Um, we've actually got, isn't that interesting? We've got, let, let's just go back to the other, uh, our time is finished. Let's go back to the room and join everybody else. And, and so we can get moving on the last part of Michael, our really important just time. Because we yeah? have 30 seconds left and I okay. sent a question from Marina if the mirror board okay. would be available for the next few days. So uh, I think that's indeed a good suggestion. We can leave the, the mirror board open. So if if uh, if participants yes. would like to, to uh, if they get some more inspiration or if they have a chance to process, they can still add some thoughts in the next couple of days. Perfect. And with that, I think uh, everyone can uh, head back to the main room indeed. We can indeed. And, and remember, we're all part of the same team. We're learning together. And thank you very much for being part of us on our journey.